Hi, could you give, you, give us uh, your introduction? Sure. My name is Mary Jane Bradley, and um, I came here to what was then Raymond Walters College um, in 1978 um, and taught here for about 32 years. Um, it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> so what brought you here? Well, um, I had been teaching nursing at Ohio State previously and then the College of Nursing. And then after a few years, my children were in grade school and I wanted to go back to teaching nursing. So um, someone told me, you know, there's a college right near you that has a nursing program. And that's how I came over here. And I was interviewed and hired right away and started here. Did you have much like expectations for teaching here? Um, well, I had already taught, you know, in a, in a couple of places, so um, you know they needed a person that had a background in psychiatry, and mental health, and I had that from my graduate programs, and um, you know I was eager to do it. It was a very small department. I think there were only maybe seven faculty at the time. Maybe a few more than that. And not very many students, um, probably about 60 students, maybe, um, in nursing. So, you know, I was glad to come here and try it out. Um, what got you interested in nursing? Oh, in nursing. Oh, <laughs> well, um, let's see, back in, 19, in the late 50s, um, when I was in high school, there weren't too many choices for women, um, and my mother said, well, you know, you could really be an English teacher or a nurse. She said, I think you'd make a really good English teacher. So, <laughs> being an adolescent of that age, I went into nursing, and I, I got fortunate because it was a perfect match. It was a very good field for me. It worked out very well. In fact, I didn't retire until I was 68 years old because I love the students, and I love teaching, and particularly this college. It was just a wonderful place to practice and to teach, so, you know, that's why I stayed. What was the hiring process like? You know, I remember being interviewed by the, I think at the time, the director of the department, I think that's what her title was, um, and, I don't think we had they had search committees there in the nursing department. Um, and then I was interviewed by Ernie Muntz, and he was the dean then, and that was it. You know, a couple days later they called me and said I had the job, so, you know. They needed a person in, that had a background to teach psychiatry and mental health, and I had quite a bit of experience in that area, so. It was pretty simple back then. No search committees and lots of things. I mean, I'm sure I submitted a resume, you know, I had that, but um, it wasn't complicated. It wasn't difficult, as I remember, anyway. But I had taught at the College of Nursing, so, you know, that was probably, that probably helped, even though it had been a few years before that, so. You said you were at Ohio State prior? Yes. Yes, I got my graduate school and, and my undergraduate bachelor's was from Ohio State. And then I taught there um, for a couple of years um, until my husband got transferred to Cincinnati. And that's, I taught in the school, it was a school of nursing then um, at Ohio State. And I taught, uh, I taught mental health and human relations in the nursing department. And we had an interdisciplinary course for nursing students, pharmacy students, and medical students. Um, and I liked that very much. But, you know, that was my background in teaching, so. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you hope your students took away from your uh, classes? Oh, my. Well, you know, you hope you take a lot away, but our students brought a lot to our classes. You know, they were very motivated, mostly young women back then, not very many men. Um, and they, they were really hardworking, energetic people, and they were very interested in 
helping people and taking care of people. And what we did was just build on that kind of urge to add knowledge and skills so that, you know, they were quite good. And our students were very good students um, and, you know, graduated. And at that time, um, we had very good pass rates for the license exam and an excellent reputation in the city. You know, anywhere we wanted to go and have our students have clinical practice, they were always eager to have them. Um, because they were very hard-working students and well-motivated and very responsible. You know. Fortunately, you forget the ones that maybe weren't quite that good, but you know, even now, I meet students because I do some workshops with hospice of Cincinnati and they're for practicing nurses. And um, so I meet some that come back and say, oh, I remember I had you in such and such a year. You know, and they're still practicing nursing. Um, uh, and they're quite enthusiastic about what they learned in the program here. So it's been quite successful, I think, really. I was so glad and fortunate to be a part of it, really. Did you face any challenges throughout your teaching career? Oh, uh, yeah, of course you do. You know, mm -hmm. that's part of it. Um, I mentioned to you that when I came here, I think I said that in the paper that I fill out. When I first came here, um, the female departments had appointed heads, and the rest of the departments in the college elected their chairs. And that was kind of like not uncommon in the late 70s. Um, and somehow the climate, I think, in the city, I said, I remember there were three of us, I think, that went to this presentation by um, somebody, maybe Jean Baker Miller. She had written a book about the psychology of women in education and that sort of thing. And she did a presentation here, and then Gloria Steinem did a presentation. And they both happened within about a year, within the same year. And it kind of gave us, some of us, the idea that, you know, we should be running our own department just like history and psychology and those other things. And so I remember we talked to the dean, to Ernie, about it, and he just sat there and kind of smiled. And it was sort of like, well, ladies, if you think you want to do this, let's see how you manage it, you know. He wasn't in opposition by any means, but he wasn't going to do it for us, you know. So at some point after a year of conversation and convincing each other that indeed we could run a department, um, it happened, you know, we elected our chairperson and, and all the structure that goes with it, all the governance structure. Um, but I think, you know, this was nursing and nurses didn't have a long history in the university. Um, you know, they started out in, in hospitals and not um, in the academic environment. So they were kind of the youngsters. Um, in academe, and so um, getting to getting to have your own department and elect your own head and make your own governance structure and write your bylaws and all that business was news to us. You know, so that was a very exciting time. You know, new things to do, and there were some people that were, "Are you sure we can do this?" I mean, they didn't come around and say that, but they were kind of reluctant and and hesitant. So. But some of us were quite enthusiastic about it and knew we could do it. Um, and so that was, that was a good thing, you know. Were there any big, like, oppositions to, you know, you all trying to form this department? Uh, you know, I think there were some people that had misgivings, but I wouldn't say there was great opposition. There was just sort of lack of confidence. You know, more than anything, just lack of certainty that it could be that we could do it because, you know, other, <laughs> well, we didn't have any models, you know, immediately available to us. Um, so, you know, lack of experience, and you're not sure. But, but like I said, the external world environment was such that it was very supportive of, of that kind of thing. You know, of women taking charge of of what they were doing and demonstrating their confidence and, you know, and doing it their way, you know, you know, that was
skills. That was, and in, in the end, that was good for our students because we were kind of modeling the kind of nursing practice that we wanted them to be able to do. You know, and if you can't run your own business, how can you ever run a unit or, you know, take care of a group of patients or teach people health care? So, you know, it kind of played out that way. Yeah, so did you feel as though there was more support once, like, the department got running and... Always I felt there was support. Here in the college, there was support. You know, I, you know the, this college had kind of a unique beginning in that sense, I think. When I came here, I shared an office with a woman in chemistry. And all of the faculty had offices with people of different disciplines. So it created a very collegial kind of um, group that saw the college as our students not just your department students, but the students in the college were your students. And so we had a very cohesive group of people that were quite committed to quality teaching in this, in this college. And I think Ernie Muntz, he put that group of people together initially, you know, early, and um, it, that created the kind of an environment that they were very supportive of, of self-governance, of um, any kind of a structure that was going to be supportive to students and help students and you know it was you could go to other departments and get help with different kinds of things among faculty and it was very it also made for a lot of interdisciplinary work the college committees here um, worked very well together and there were people from every department you know who did things and Everybody had the same goal, so you know, that was good for our students. Did you ever feel like there was like uh, like it's power dynamics between um, like the UC Blue Ash and Mini Campus? You know, if there were, I didn't experience it at my level. You know, um, Ernie was a great dean. I mean, I I don't know. He was a dean here for like twenty years. Um, and was very supported by the faculty. Um, and so I think kind of Clifton probably saw us as just kind of like the college that's functioning very well, rightly, slightly out of our realm. You know, we were 20, 20 minutes away and probably were not giving him any headaches at all. So, you know. I, I don't remember any strains, and if there were, they were at a higher level, you know, than I was aware of, so, you know. And we were just growing and growing and growing, you know, and having more and more students and needing more and more buildings. I'm sure that was competition for getting money to, you know, for capital improvements. That was probably the big, you know, where's the money going to go? What are your thoughts on the expansion of um, UC Blue Ash? I'm sure we needed it. <laughs> you know, I'm sure we did, because we were always squeezed for space, you know, classroom space and office space and that sort of thing. So I think it's nothing but good. And also, we were inclined to be very adaptive to what students needed in terms of, I mean, all, most of our students have you know, they had families, they had jobs, they had all kinds of responsibilities other than uh, just going to school. So we had to be quite accommodating, you know, the hours and the... I remember in nursing we started offering an evening clinical section so that students could, who had jobs and had families could still have... In fact, that's what I was... I taught here one quarter part-time because we were on quarters then. And that was one of the things they wanted, was um, someone who would teach in the evenings, um, teach a clinical nursing course in the evening. And I thought, that'd be great. My children need to see that their dad can feed them dinner and put them to bed and do all those kinds of things that I did. Um, and so I took on the evening program. Um, and I enjoyed it. And we were always had more students that wanted it than we had spaces for. A good thing. Mm -hmm. Good thing for students. 
What was the largest class size that you taught? Well, our class size, um, uh, probably, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I would say maybe 40. But our clinical groups were 10 or 12. So the clinical students that you really had the closest contact with was a much smaller group, you know, when you spent quite a bit of time with them. Um, no. So as we increased students, we had to increase faculty because you had to have a faculty member with every 10 or 12 students in the clinical setting. So as the student population grew, the faculty grew in the department. So, and I don't know how big it is now. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's bigger than seven, you know. Yeah, it's probably 25, something like that, maybe. I don't know. I, I'm just guessing. Yeah. Did you have any, like, core values or principles that you wanted to instill in the students? Well, probably the core values that um, we wanted students to have had to do with their care um, and compassion for sick people, you know, for, um, for the patients they encountered, and that they had to bring competence, you know, skill and confidence to what they were doing, because um, it's one thing to be kind, but kind, kindness with knowledge about what helps people when they're sick, you know, that's what people need. So, you know, we wanted them to value learning and lifelong learning was a requirement in nursing and as it is in all of healthcare. Um, and, you know, we kept pushing that, I'm sure, but they recognized it. You know, if you're in practice, you recognize right away how important it is to keep up, you know, in current, current science and that kind of thing. Compassion without confidence isn't, doesn't cut it. <laughs> when people are really sick, they want somebody that really knows what's, what they're doing, so. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so, did you, were you able to form relationships with colleagues outside your department? Oh, yes, but I need to take a drink of water. Oh, you're <laughs> <good. laughs> kind of good. You know, it's one thing when you're teaching and you're used to talking a lot like this, but I'm not. <laughs> Well, like I said, the structure of the college itself facilitated that, you know, because sharing offices with people in dis different disciplines, you know, that was the first thing. And then the college committees were made up of people from all different departments. Um, so, you know, you immediately developed good working relationships with, with people in other disciplines. And that was a real strength of the college, because um, then you have a group of faculty that are from all different disciplines, but very cohesive about what they're trying to do here, you know, what their, what their primary mission was. Um, so. And the staff was, I should say that too, because the staff was very um, supportive and committed to, to quality. I remember, I just saw Kathy Schmadel over at, um, in a, a bird shop over in, in Montgomery, and she was one of the advisors for students then. And, you know, she was every bit as committed to figuring out how can we schedule this student into this section so she can still pick up her kids after school and, you know, that kind of thing. So there was a real, um, a real commitment on the part of the staff to support the students, you know, all of our students. Um, that was a real strength. I'm sure that still is a strength of a college. You know. Yeah. So, did any um, administration like or deans like stand out to you throughout your time at? UC? Oh, Ernie was, you know, hard a hard act to follow. Um, I think Barbara Bardis was also an excellent dean for this college. Um, you know, she she shared some of Ernie's qualities in that. You seek out people that have talent, but then you let them develop and do the kinds of things that they're good at, um, and then you, you know, have a pretty successful administration. And she was that way also, I think, very much so. so. Was there ever a time where an incident or an event was handled poorly by UC? <coughs> It's 
wonderful when you're getting older, you forget the things that aren't so nice or weren't so <laughs> enjoyable. Um, I'm sure there were, because we did have a dean here, and I can't even remember his name. I just remember that it wasn't going to work out, and it didn't. Um, and we had the support of Clifton administration to remove that dean. Um, and one of the, some of the other people on the list will remember. Um, I can't even remember his name, but it didn't work well for the university, you know, and for us, it just wasn't, wasn't a good fit at all, you know, um, so he didn't stay long. <laughs> then we had a renadine right after that until we did another search. And then I think that's when Barbara Barties came in, I think. Um, so, didn't work well. <laughs> Uh, so, how has the faculty changed over time? Well, there are more of them, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, and I think they're better prepared, better educated. Um, you know, a lot of strengths that way. Um, but then that also has to do with the progress of nursing. You know, advanced degrees in nursing are much more common than they were when I had a master's degree. You know, there were very few master's programs in the country then. Um, and now, you know, there's doctorates, doctorates in nursing and you know, that sort of thing. So the faculty generally has more education, more opportunities. Um, certifications became very common. Um, that sort of thing. So there are more skilled practitioners. And then you have the opportunity to have students get better exposure and better learning. Did you ever participate in research? <coughs> Excuse me. Mm, let me take another break. <laughs> Not to any degree that I think was, you know, um, we did some studies of our students and some things about what they, you know, what they needed to support them in the program. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, other than learning, what, what are the kinds of resources they needed, that sort of thing, but not really. No, I really didn't. No. I was more involved, I think, I probably the thing that I got involved the most with that was relatively new was teaching um, about hospice and palliative care because that didn't start in this country until 1974, I think, was the first hospice in the United States. And um, Cincinnati, in Cincinnati, uh, hospice in Cincinnati was probably the first place it's a non, you know, non-profit hospice, but there were no undergraduate programs that required students to learn about hospice and palliative care. And then in the, about the late 90s, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation started funding education for nursing faculty um, to be able to teach that. Um, and so our program, two of us from our program, um, got fellowships to go to a project at City of Hope in uh, California, in LA, and, um, and get prepared to teach hospice and palliative care. So when I came back here, I thought, okay, we've got to have this course, and it has to be a required undergraduate course for nursing students. And so we did that, and we were the only place in the city that had that for undergraduate nursing students. Um, and we started with Hospice of Cincinnati as an inpatient learning experience and to go into people's homes also because a lot of hospice care was, is done even now in people's homes. So that was quite a big project um, to change your curriculum and put that in as a requirement. Um, and that was about I think we started that around 2001 or two, something like that. 
So how does the university form um, like relationships with like the hospitals to be able to send like the students out there for you make contracts. contracts. We had contracts with yeah. all different healthcare agencies. Um, when I left, let's see, I retired in two thousand ten, and about that time we had contracts with sixty three healthcare facilities um, to have students there for learning. So you go and you have a meeting and you talk about what your students are qualified to do and what their requirements are, what they need, um, you know, what kind of supervision you will provide your students because we always had faculty on site um, supervising students. Uh, and you meet beforehand and you meet afterwards and you evaluate and you talk about how are you going to make it better and, and um, what's the best benefit for students to come to that institution. So we were pretty selective, actually. I said that 62 contracts sounds like a lot. But when you think of all the places that people get health care, that's not really um, too many places. We had every, every major city in the hospital, or every hospital in the city we had contracts with, I know. You negotiate the contract, you know, and many a visit have I done that, you know. And Were there any times where you see, like, withdrew their contracts with certain university yes. or not certain hospitals? Like? We, there, were, there were a few instances where the quality of the nursing care that the students were seeing, we did not think was good, and we removed our students from those agencies. Fortunately, there weren't many, you know, because that, that's a pretty big deal, you know, to do that. But, um, but when you're trying to teach people to do things, you want them to see the best care there is, so that that sets the standard, you know, for what they would do in their own practice, and that's what we were looking for. So, and in most cases, agencies that have students in practice do see the quality of care, it gets better, um, you know. It's sort of like, well, no, I was going to say it's sort of like playing golf. I was thinking of that yesterday. When you play golf with people that are really good, you tend to do better. So when students see nurses in practice that are really good, they tend to practice better, you know. So that was our goal. Nice. <laughs> so I guess back to research. Um, did you ever feel like, as time went on, that the like the university was more uh, became more research focused? Because I know on main campus, some faculty and students like. Talk about well, I think they seems, are more yeah. research focused, um, you know, um, and I mean, evidence-based practice is absolutely what we need in all of healthcare. So, you know, the research focus is definitely a need. You know, the difficulty is taking that research and applying it to practice. You know, how do you get from the theoretical on the data that you found? and the ideas that, um, that you've supported with scientific data, and then how do you get that back into practice? That's the big challenge. Um, but, you know, I, I was never directly um, involved. I said in my first job I was involved in research because in my first job in nursing was at Ohio State um, in University Hospital in the operating room. And they did lots of research there all the time. You know, I remember once was on hand washing, and to this day, my kids, my children, who are now fifty and, and forty eight, tell me, "Mom, I re we remember, Mom, we know how to wash our hands. We know how to wash our hands because we did this study about hand washing and what kind of soap worked best and whether you should use hot water, or cold water, or all this kind of stuff." You know. But that was me as a subject, you know, part of the, they, we'd wash our hands and then they'd swab our hands and, you know, 
try to grow the organisms in petri dishes and see what how clean our hands were when we were working in the operating room. Yeah, you know, that was evidence based practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So how has, uh, oh, were you going to say something? Well, I, so I think the university focusing on, you know, more research is, is good for us. Um, you have to balance it, though, with quality teaching. I mean, because otherwise you don't bridge the, you don't get down to how do you apply the research to um, everyday education, you know, to what you're trying to teach your students. So. Here, I think the emphasis was always on quality teaching. You know, that was the major emphasis. Now there were research projects on teaching, you know, and quality teaching and what constitutes um, effective classroom environment and that sort of thing. You know, and that was always worth doing. Yeah. So how has uh, the campus become more diverse over time? Uh, I, I suppose, um, I mean, I know it became more diverse, but what, why, um, I guess because there was just a major push to make it more diverse, you know, to make it available. But I think when you make it available at different hours to people, you're going to get a more diverse population. Um, when you have a lot of really good support services for students, um, you know, tutoring services and um, that sort of thing, you can get a more diverse population. And that was always a strength of this college. You know, the um, student services were really good. You know, we had a language lab and an English lab and a math lab and, you know, student, for students to get help with their um, courses in those disciplines. Um, and that, you know, added, made for a more diverse population. You know, and I think in healthcare, I mean, you recognize the population you're serving is very diverse, so the people doing it have to be diverse um, to fit better with the population you're serving. So, um. How has technology impacted the way that you've taught over time? I think probably um, resources more readily available to students, because I was thinking one of the one of the later things was because when they had, um, well, they weren't smartphones then, but they had access readily to computerized information about drugs um, and pharmacology that became really important because you can't carry in your head the information about all the medications that people receive. Um, so you have to have reliable access to that kind of thing and quickly in a very efficient kind of way. Um, so the technology used in healthcare really impacted you know, students in the clinical setting. Um, I think in the classroom it did too, um, in that you could do video demonstrations of what you were trying to teach. And you, know, you can slow it down and go through it step by step. And then you can um, have students demonstrate it. You can use um, videos for uh, for role playing and for that kind of thing, and and go back over it and say, okay, see the interaction and what you did and what you said and you know that sort of thing. So that impacted. Um, oh, what else? But I don't think you could ever replace the face-to-face, -face, hands-on interaction that students have with patients. You know, that's, you know, the real pieces are in the human interaction. So, but it's great to learn all about it, you know, in, in different formats, um, as well as doing it yourself. You know, some students just have to do it themselves to learn. You know, they can't learn from videos. So, did you ever see technology as like a distraction in the classroom for students? See what? I'm sorry. Uh, was technology ever like a distraction to students in the classroom? No, I remember cell phones. We used to have to tell students they had to leave their cell phones in the conference room when they went to take care of patients because they couldn't 
be answering their phones, <laughs> but that was, you know, that's probably the only distraction, you know, I think. You know, I don't, don't think that it was, really. Yeah. It was mostly helpful. You know. Yeah, so you didn't see any, like, much of a disconnect? No, not during, but see, I've been retired for almost 10 years, and I think things have changed a lot since then, you know. Um, so, no, I really didn't see it then. You'd have to talk to somebody that's teaching right now <laughs> to see that, I think. You know? Are you good? <laughs> I'm not used to talking this much. <laughs> so, do you have any thoughts on the unionization? Of like faculty, the what? A uh, union, the unionization. The AUP. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was really involved in that for years um, here, because um, this was a strong, a strong base for um, the AUP in the seventies and a. No, not 70s, maybe in the 80s and 90s, that sort of thing. Um, I'm sure there were, I mean, I know there were advantages definitely to that. Um, and at that time, I'm trying to think of what, you know, what the issues were. I mean, I'm sure there were issues of workload and compensation and benefits and all that kind of thing, um, which is what, you know, usually is the focus of any kind of um, of organization of of people that are doing the work. Um, I thought we did a lot of good and held to the focus of um, teaching students. You know that that was what we were really about was high quality education. Um, there was a lot of competition for dollars and. So making sure your money is going for that purpose, um, you know, that was always an issue. And yet, on the other hand, you couldn't expect people to be working, and the, the workload issues were great because people kept track of how many hours do you really spend, you know, you only spend so many hours in the classroom, but there's a whole lot more to teaching than just being in the classroom. So, you know, that was a big issue, you know. That we always worked on. I thought it was a strength, definitely a strength. Um, it also helped dialogue in when there's when there's conflict. Um, if you if people feel confident in their position, like I think tenured faculty feel, they can take opposite positions without risking um, their own future. And so that kind of, of disagreement um, is really important for the life of any, any uh, institution, I think. You know, it makes, makes for a better place for people to have different points of view and diverse points of view and have a lot of respect and expression for those points of view so that you can come up with something that's better. Um, and I think that AUP supported that kind of thing very much. But that was a long time ago. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have thought about it for for ten years or more more than that, really. Um, so, how do you think the whole um, union would have been shaped if more people were able to voice their opinions, their perspective, without you know risking their job or something like that? I really don't know how to answer that. I hadn't <laughs> thought about that at all. Um, because we all, I always felt that we did have the opportunity to express different opinions and try to come to some resolution that was a good, um, a good fit for your goals. Because you've got to keep in mind, what is your desired outcome? What is it you're really trying to get you know, or have accomplished? And you've got to incorporate lots of different perspectives in order to do that, you know, and, I don't know, 
I don't don't really know how to answer that. <laughs> um, so did you participate in any of the strikes? Oh yes. Oh definitely. Mm-hmm. Yes, every one of them. Yes. Yes, I participated in lots of ways. <laughs> Making signs, carrying signs, um, distributing donuts, um, <laughs> coffee refills, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Figuring out ways that we were going to provide our students with good nursing education at the same time as having a strike was a real challenge. You know, because their lives were going on and school was going to end and the quarter was going to be over and they needed credit for courses and they needed um, the opportunity to learn the things they had to learn. In the meantime, um, while you were carrying on a strike at the university, that was always a challenge. You know, that was hard to do. I remember having classes in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you face any huge oppositions to the union? Or did it, were there really, like, not here? That really, not um, here? No, not here. Uh-uh. And I think it's because this was a very collegial environment where there wasn't a lot of conflict. There wasn't much conflict at all between the administration and the faculty. Um, it was a very together place. So, you know, we really didn't. Yeah. Why do you think people, there would be people against the union? Well, I guess it tends to dilute the power um, in an organization and spread it among everybody rather than just at the head. Um, so, if you're trying to keep control of everything, um, <laughs> you don't want a union, you know. Um, and I think it's probably, well, I don't know how, how it affects outcomes, really, except that if you are, have a lot of people that are working together on the same project and they have the same goals, um, you know, if you can keep them all together, and yet they're individual, they're people, so their needs have to be met. I mean, they, in order to function at their best, they have to have their needs met. So. That's the art in it, is matching the people with the projects and the activities and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I don't know, I think probably it's got to do with power. Unions tend to dilute the power of the organization um, and spread it around to the people that belong to it. So. Mm. Yeah. Um, so did you, uh, face any challenges with like the transition of UC from a like a municipal to a state school? You know, I remember when that happened. I think it was nineteen seventy. Was it around that time? But um, no, I don't remember that. And I think I wasn't. You know, I was just a beginning instructor then, and I wasn't paying that much close attention to what was going on at that level, you know. I thought it was absolutely terrific that Cincinnati had supported a college, you know, for so long, um, way ahead of lots of other cities in the, in the country. And um, I think New York University and the University of Cincinnati were, there were very few city colleges you know, that actually, um, and I think that's a great part of its history, you know. It means that there's always been a cadre of people that valued higher education, you know, in this area, and that's that's strength of the city, strength of the community. Um, I said I cried all the way, I told you, from Columbus to here, but after I had lived here for a while, I thought, oh, what a blessing that was. <laughs> you know, there was marvelous things in this city that I hadn't encountered um, in Columbus. But then it was just a small town, not a great big city like <laughs> this now. So. Yeah. Um, did any of the faculty that you worked with feel as though like the um, autonomy of the, I guess, like the curriculum was like compromised because they had to switch to 
from a city to a I don't city. think so. Not that I not that I remember. I mean, we were working very hard to um, make sure that courses that we were offering for an associate degree were accepted in, in Clifton for um, baccalaureate programs. You know, and there was a lot of back and forth to do that. To um, but it, it, I don't think it was an issue in terms of conflict. It was just that you needed to do a lot of work to make it fit. You know, um, and in terms of becoming a state school, not I don't remember that at all. That you know, that was pretty. There was a lot of enthusiasm for that. One thing I think it meant access to more money. You know, there were more things you could do. Um, so that was probably the driving force. Did you ever feel like UC's priorities have like shifted? Hmm. I never really felt that way. Um, you know, I I didn't well during the time that I was here at all. So. But like I said, I've been retired for ten years almost, so <laughs> you no. Know. So how have you seen UC connect with Cincinnati or like the community around it? Oh, I think some of the leadership in Cincinnati, in the, at the university has really been much more aware of, um, I guess maybe of the foundations that are actually within the, within the city, you know, and the community, um, and be very involved in, in things in the city, and I think that's wonderful. Um, from my perspective, because in healthcare, we, like I said, we had all these contracts with all these healthcare agencies around the city. So in a sense, we were already there, you know, in, in a very intimate kind of thing in that we were working with all these different healthcare agencies. So when the university sees itself as a major player in the well-being of the whole, so not just the city, but the whole, um, what, all the counties in, in Northern Kentucky, um, that's good for the university and it's good for the environment. You know, it's good for all the people that live in this area, so I think the more involved we are, the better, you know. So in what ways has uh, UC became more like involved in the community? I'm sure there are major projects going on in Clifton um, that hook up people um, and disciplines with in the community. Um, you know, years ago, I was trying to remember when, I think it was <coughs> Ford maybe? Anyway, there was a big layoff in an industry, and, and Mike and, and Dawn would know about this better than I do. Um, and Harriet Florey, she was here then in the 60s, um, I'm sorry, in the 80s, the late 80s. Um, and people needed a lot of retraining because they were losing jobs. And I think it was Ernie Muntz, and I know um, Harriet Florey were involved in designing this project called the Work and Learning Council, where we could offer courses that would facilitate on site at some plants, and I, I hesitate to say which, I thought it was Ford and maybe GE, um, courses that would help people gain new, skill, new skills so that when they were laid off from these jobs, um, they had some opportunities and some possibilities um, for other employment. Um, and that was a huge service, you know. And it was also valuable because, in a, in a sense, it connected the college here with more of what's going on in the real world and what are we doing that would help people that you know, need more education or more skill in a particular area. So that was, when, when did I say, in the 80s, I think, sometime in the 80s. 
I wasn't directly involved in that, but I certainly knew a lot about it. I was on the on the council that uh, made up some of the criteria that we needed to use and the courses we needed to to offer that sort of thing. But I never did directly did any teaching in it or any kind of involvement that way. Yeah. So some people have this perception that. Um, <coughs> oh, you take a drink. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just. Mm. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, so some people have this perception that main campus is automatically better than like Blue Ash or like a community college. Like what, what are your thoughts towards that? I guess I didn't know people had that perception. <laughs> um, hmm. Well, I think that probably what's best is what meets the students' needs. Um, you know based on what their work life, their other responsibilities, their goals for themselves, what kind of, of, um, of education they're going for and what disciplines and that sort of thing. Um, I, I guess I see them really as very prosperous partnerships. I don't think it's... Um, necessarily a competition at all um, you know I think it's wonderful I remember when you know our students could go from an associate degree and more quickly get a bachelor's degree um, that's a wonderful thing but and at the same time they could have a job and be able to support themselves and pay for more education um, and that's certainly an advantage that, that bridges the two uh, the college and the university. Here. So, is that what you were thinking about? What you meant? Uh, kind of like uh, I don't know because there's so. I mean, there's. I think people perceive there's more research and and that kind of focus um, in Clifton. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's true. You know, that's um, this is more of a hands-on environment you know, of an immediate teaching, high yeah. quality teaching um, to undergraduate students, um, you know, but, but there are probably about 5,000 of them here, so you know you're meeting a need, um, <laughs> and it's pretty important, and people have to start someplace, you know, um, mm -hmm. that's a good place to start. Yeah, it gives you options. Yes, a lot of options, and it accommodates a lot your life so that you know you've got time to have a job have a family um, have responsibilities and still be educated improve your life improve the quality of what you're doing yeah so where do you see the future of UC going hmm well, I imagine it will continue to be very involved in the life of the community. I mean, the community at large, um, you know, and I think in, in healthcare, in medical research, it's definitely leading, you know, one of the leading research places that attracts people from not just the city, but, you know, from people from all over the world um, to come here and, and study and live here can contribute to the quality of what we've got. Um, I think it will continue to do that. You know. But we never want to lose sight of the importance of educating that basic undergraduate student to start with, you know, because that's where it has to start. Um, I think it impacts, too, I hope, the quality of education um, in preschool um, one of my children actually went to a preschool here that one of the faculty, and I didn't know her well, I can't even remember her name, one of the faculty started where they, were te where they had a Montessori school um, in Blue Ash somewhere. 
this was more than 50 years ago, so I don't remember exactly the details. But, um, and it was one of the few Montessori programs around. Um, and the faculty member here was, owned it and started it. Um, so, you know, that's a lot different now. <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to tell us that we haven't talked about? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I don't think so. Um, no, I still have great regard for this change. Now, what you see blue ash, I keep thinking of it as Raymond Walters College because that's what it was almost all the time that I was here. In fact, it was all the time. It's definitely a strength of the community. You know? I tried to remember some dates before we, uh, before I came, but mm. <laughs> <laughs> no. were there any like important events that happened? You I think the things that I to have told you about were things that, I mean, there were funny things that happened and, you know, things that, um, <coughs> um, Blue Ash Incorporated paid a lot of attention, I think, to how this college was going. And at some point, they had, there was a planning commission or a planning committee and the college had people, I was on that representative, you know, that went from, from the college to the community because I think that um, Ernie Munz recognized the importance of developing closer ties to Blue Ash, to the city, you know, and they were very welcoming, you know, to that idea. Um, so, you know, that was, a, that was a good thing for the college in terms of growing and using resources and and that sort of thing. So. I don't think I have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> no. There was a lot of talent here. Ernie Mentz was very good about identifying people that had a lot of talent and pulling them together in his administration. <laughs> And that, and then letting them do their thing really well, and supporting that, uh, so that helped the college. Um, so, what were your proudest moments? I know in uh, 2006 you received the Distinguished uh, Teaching Award. Tell me about that. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know it. I, I was a pretty good teacher, yes I was, but I had really good students. They were motivated and they worked really hard and um, that makes for, you know, the opportunity to be a good teacher. Um, you're trying to do better because your students need for you to be as good as you can. Um, and, you know, and there was, I had a group of people around me, colleagues, that were quite supportive and quite um, encouraging. Um, to be good teachers, you know, all of us. So, I, I think it was really the environment that promoted my developing, my ability to do it. Um, you know, I was grateful to my colleagues and, <laughs> and to my students because you learn from your students. You learn so much from your students. I liked it. I said I talked till I was I was sixty eight years old when I retired because I liked it so much. You know, it was very satisfying work. Do you have any other memorable moments at UC? 
Oh, there were lots of memorable moments. <laughs> lots of them, you know. <coughs> and, you, and you have your students do things with patients that are so kind and so thoughtful and so helpful. Well, those are memorable moments because they've learned, you know, they've learned compassion and they've learned to use their knowledge to really help people. Um, those are things that give you a lot of satisfaction, you know. Great. Um, yeah, so we just got right through the questions. Um, oh, good. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad to do it. I'm glad you're doing it because I think it's really important, you know, for the good things about this college to be known. <laughs>